द अमेरिकन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन कंटेंट दैट इट्स अ टू पार्टी सिस्टम ओनली अ टू पार्टी सिस्टम इन अमेरिका वन ऑफ दैम हैपन्स टू बी द रिपब्लिकन पोलिटिकल पार्टी द अदर वन हैपन्स टू बी द डेमोक्रेट्स द डेमोक्रेट पोलिटिकल पार्टी द फर्स्ट कैंडिडेट वेदर इट इज कमला हैरिस और डोनाल्ड ट्रंप विच एवर रीच इज द टू सेवेंटी मार्क और द लार्जर मार्क इफ इट इज अ क्लोज कॉन्टेस्ट that person would be anointed as the most powerful person on the face of the earth aka the american president as an american if you were to narrow down five issues that govern their decision making on who should be the president kamala harris has clearly identified his entire electoral agenda and what she intends to do let's say issues like gun running issues like immigration issues like foreign policy and the state of the economy whatever there she seems to have an edge so how important is the element of foreign policy america needs us and we need america as a kind of a transactional code procure but kamala harris has supported pakistan cost us lives of brave soldiers since world war 2 the domestic polity in america I would like to reiterate is a spectacle, mm. and it's a showman, showmanship, mm. and the candidate has to sell his agenda. Trump carrying in power is beneficial for the Russia or even China. The Russian establishment held the first coming of Donald Trump as the American president. United States of America will not act as a global policeman. Who do you think will win the elections? Today we dive into the heart of the American dream, the US foreign policy and its far-reaching influence on the world stage with none other than Dr. Manan Devedi, a distinguished scholar in international relations and US foreign policy. With decades of research and insights into the most pivotal global issues, from the rags to riches, narrative that defines America's identity to the rise of Donald Trump and his America first approach. We explore the shifts in US influence the changing role of the superpower and what the next US presidency could mean for the world politics are we witnessing the decline of american dominance or is it merely a recalibration of its global strategy with dr devedi's unmatched expertise we also touch on the larger than life aspects of american politics the two party system and the critical issues shaping the us today immigration guns and abortion We promise a thought-provoking conversation that brings you closer to understanding America's national character, its place in the world, and why its leadership remains crucial to the global stability. Stay tuned as we dive into the intersection of the India-US relations and how these two democracies can forge a stronger coalition in the face of an evolving world order. This is a conversation you won't want to miss. Without further ado, let's get started. Before we dive into today's conversation, I just want you to take a quick moment. We looked at the analytics and noticed that 93% of you who watch our videos regularly aren't subscribed yet. If you're enjoying our content and want us to keep going with more insightful conversation, we'd really appreciate if you could take just a second to subscribe. It might seem like a small action, but it goes a long way in helping us grow and bringing even more amazing content your way. Thanks for your support. It means the world to us. Now let's get back to the video. So to begin with, since it's the election period in the US, much awaited, it's going to be November. Before we get into the election part of the 2024 presidential election, I would want to ask you a very basic question about the Americans. They used to sell the American dream earlier. This is during the Cold War era. What exactly is the American dream? You know, if you look into the American ethos and the kind of meaning that the entire world and its domesticity in America attaches to the idea of american dream then we can look into it that the americans have always lived by a dictum of exceptionalism they believe just like the jury does uh, in israel and in palestine uh, in israel in jerusalem they think that they have been anointed by destiny something which the americans call as call as manifest destiny that is they are not actually similar to what the britishers used to do that is there is a mistake which is normally committed by equating and clubbing america in the entire western paraphernalia of nations great britain they did it under the auspices of trade benefits and monetary benefits under the ambit of 
mission civil trees that is they are considered the indians or the rest of the asians or their colonies to be inferior people and who were raw uncivilized and they had to be a cultured they had to be sanskritized by the britishers now that kind of an idea is often confused with what the american establishment has been doing the americans what they did was that from 1787 onwards when they attained their independence uh, through after the britishers uh, cornwallis lost to george washington in the battle of saratoga in 1782 since then the americans developed their internal strength and girth and they developed their own prosperity and military and economic strength this, this is what they did and if you look uh, into into history once again they kind of as a stratagem they sequestered and isolated themselves from the rest of the world it was only with the spanish war in 1898 that the americans started uh, i won't use the word imposing but they utilized they started propagating and amplifying the strength and the military and economic superiority of america if we have a look into the uh, the academic part of the american dream so i would personally feel that uh, there was a scholar uh, john truslow adams who first of all coined the term in 1920s in one of his books the american dream he titled it as and since then it has become a working bible or you know the working uh, framework for american foreign policy and the domestic policy in america that is one way i would like to put it forth as that is american dream no, for but uh, for the basic american demographic what what do they mean when they say we are living the d- american dream is it financially stable dream is it is it the lives are very you know happiness index is high what is the american dream for them this is a very political scenario very you given us scenario. but for a for a very basic american what is the american dream for them definitely shivam that's a very pertinent query and i would like to shed some light on it the idea is that the americans uh, they have this dictum and they have this uh, kind of a narrative which does the round which tells us that even a pauper a person on the street can become a rich and successful person mm. and even a small kid once he asked uh, president uh, abraham lincoln he wrote a letter to him and he wanted to have a talk with him he wanted to meet the american president <laughs> that is lincoln so at that particular point of time lincoln met that kiddo and that kid uh, any assured that kid that don't be little yourself hmm. don't uh, think lightly of yourself because if you are capable if you are good at your vocation if you are a true blue entrepreneur if you are a good uh, the worker for the for your family and your town hmm. then you can even go all the way up to becoming an american president mm-hmm. so that kind of a rags to riches narrative which is very much part and part of the american part and parcel of the american life and the american credo or something which the americans call it as a, a mount sinai exceptionalism mm-hmm. so the how a middle class personage how a middle class personage can actually go ahead and become rich successful and powerful mm-hmm. and contribute to the national uh, ethos or the national output that is something which is uh, associated with the theme of american dream mm-hmm. and as you have already mentioned it in your earlier uh, introduction the soft power it's basically a soft power approach which has been very dutifully and elegantly and very effectively it has been implemented in the american foreign policy too for example we have to go slightly beyond the the cold war be, behind the, uh, earlier than the cold war where we can talk about the uh, the world war 2 where for the first time it became a kind of a unipolar world Mm-hmm. before the soviet union people before stalin started breathing down the neck of the americans mm-hmm. so he went in there the americans went in there and they actually there was a collaboration which was ignited by the american establishment the war office of america the us state department wherein they created it might seem a very light command mm-hmm. but that is something which has a, has had an indelible impact upon the rest of the world because of the shenanigans and maneuverings of american foreign policy mm-hmm. what they did was that they uh, recruited people to come out with marvel comics they recruited people to come out with dc comics and they also uh, looked for a toe hold mm-hmm. into the hollywood 
वेयर इन कैरेक्टर्स वर इन्वेंटेड विच वर वेरी मच एक्चुअली नॉट इन्वेंटेड दे वर पार्ट एंड पार्सल ऑफ द अमेरिकन फ्रंटियर स्पिरिट दे वर पार्ट एंड पार्सल ऑफ द अमेरिकन वाइल्ड वेस्ट एंड दे वेंट इन देयर एंड क्रिएटेड कैरेक्टर्स विच वंस अगेन शुड नॉट बी टेकन वेरी लाइटली इट इज समथिंग ऑल इज सुपरमैन स्पाइडरमैन द बैटमैन John Wayne, the cowboy flicks, the sound of uh, crack guns and uh, the hoofs of the uh, horses, mm -hmm. and the cowboys and the sheriffs uh, and the bounty clash with each other in the ramshackle and arid confines and environs of American Wild West towns. Mm -hmm. That kind of an image, that kind of a pictureization, and that kind of a comical and cinematic uh, depiction. Became the spectacle that the American dream is all about. Was it just about to? Was it to inspire the the population? Very true. It was there to inspire the American population mm -hmm. because the Americans had to st stay forth into what uh, their founding fathers had contended right. when Americans became free. That is what I would like to say. What sets America so apart? Like they've been ruling the world for the last hundred one fifty years. You know that that we have seen different superpowers as well, but. We haven't seen a super power like the U.S., who has been so dominant in all spheres, from technology to economy to trade to even defense. What keeps them so apart and from rest of the world and the other nations? Well, I would like to answer it pretty briefly here. I would like to contend that there is a term, there is a nomenclature which which we all, as school kids and college going kids, have learned about. Mm -hmm. The term is national character. Now, Americans, the Japanese, the Germans, why they are powerful countries? Why they have made a name for themselves, mm -hmm. and why their influence is being felt all around the world. Even Russia, we cannot leave out the Russians, the Ruskies, as I would like to call them. The idea is that about national character. That mm -hmm. is, they are unabashedly patriotic. The Americans have been unabashedly and unembarrassedly patriotic, courageous, and nationalistic in their day-to-day -day routinized lives. Something a, a cliche term I am utilizing here that is called as routinized rituals. Now we, as Indians, we can go back to our Sanatani times. We can go go back to our Vedic times. But you know the fissipariousness and the apologetic nature mm -hmm. of the Indian citizenry as a kind of a lot who do not openly militate against their enemies. We are reactive. We are not proactive. So that kind of a you know a relaxed oeuvre or relaxed genre mm -hmm. of a response. Hmm. becomes part of india's nationalism which is done very on the contrarily very militantly very aggressively and very proactively by the americans mm -hmm. and the americans have a credo that they want their country to be number one the popularity of the former president donald trump came out through the clarion call of maga that is make america great again because definitely we cannot only talk about an appreciation and uh, eulogization of united states of america our decline has definitely crept into the american empire or the american influence where especially in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis the uh, the lehman brothers crisis when the banks fell when the uh, and the economic system of america and most of the capitalist countries collapsed Since then, the Americans, especially, it started. This trend started with President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. They started looking back into their own follies, their lacuna, and they realized that with the peaceful, so-called clever, and with the smirk, peaceful rise of China, the Americans were threatened. Their monopoly, mm -hmm. their hyper puissance, and their hyper power status was challenged by the Chinese. and the russians too in the recent context of the ukraine russia war mm -hmm. they too have joined hands with the chinese and the north koreans yes so coming back to our idea that kind of nation first approach is something which makes the americans superior in not in the sense that we are secondary citizens different different they makes them different to utilize a better term mm -hmm. and it makes them very much uh, what you call acuter to dealing with the the challenges of the global geopolitics and geoeconomics alike mm -hmm. that is that is one way i would like to put it for that so enough so so you said they are quite nationalist as as people the americans and that is why they have kept that superpower status for so long for for the elections in november 2024 why is the election so important for the rest of the world we always call the american president or the man or the women he might be kamala harris now hmm. 
as we portend and as we will discuss later hmm. the man or the women who is the most powerful man or the women in the world that happens to be the american president the american military economic cloud and uh, their uh, control and contested uh, uh, domineering of the supply chains now with the chinese and the rest of the countries that remains a uh, 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 that remains a focal point so you know whoever comes to the american uh, white house whoever becomes the american president will definitely have an indelible impact mm-hmm. upon the rest of the geopolitical and the geoeconomic ramifications or the conditions of the rest of the world for example we can take an issue out here now president trump might find it difficult going here as far as uh, former president mm. as far as the 224 2024 elections are concerned because he had dragged united states of america into a kind of an era of isolationism into an era he was trying to uh, sequester america from the rest of the world before looking into the european theater or the indian south asian or the central asian theater if we look into north american continent itself mm-hmm. you know the kind of immigration harsh i won't call it harsh but the kind of strict and stringent immigration uh, policies which were being framed mm-hmm. by president donald trump especially the building of the great wall which requires 20 billion dollars and more uh, as an uh, ask on the american exchequer that issue apart from that the theme of uh, staying away from uh, uh, mexico and canada mm-hmm. and not being completely aligned with nafta that is the north uh, american free trade agreement with uh, with the canada which canada enjoys a kind of a reprieve as compared to the rest of the countries in the context of america so what trump did trump wanted to withdraw america he withdrew america from the climate change treaty mm-hmm. uh, the, the the kyoto protocol americans withdrew out of it mm-hmm. and that happened during president uh, uh, donald trump's uh, what you call uh, regime only tenure only then as far as jagpoa the the joint comprehensive uh, nuclear agreement between iran and the 5 uh, uh, plus 1 parts america had to withdraw from that because president trump willed it willed it so mm-hmm. so you know that kind of uh, isolationism is something which might become we are not sure about it completely which might become a lacuna or you know a shortcoming or an obscurantist element which might creep into the american uh, uh, elections this right. time so whether trump comes it will have a different ramification for the world for the global polity and whether the democratic kamala harris comes in she will have a slightly different impact though another s- school of thought says that whoever comes to be reside in the white house the continuity in foreign policy will remain the same. will remain will remain as far as america is concerned and the standard viewpoints and the strategic uh, perceptions and policies of us let's say towards the israel hamas quagmire mm-hmm. hamas quagmire and the ukraine russia war that will remain the same mm-hmm. that is going to remain the same but still nuance wise nuances and the subtleties of the rule will vary from the democratic candidate and the republican candidate that is the former president donald trump that mm-hmm. is how i look into it mm-hmm. so why i asked you that question is because if if we see the geopolitics at the moment there's a new axis been created which isn't an, has an anti us sentiment as for a world power led by china there's russia there's iran and there is north korea before i get, we get into the us elections i want to i want to bring it to the more geopolitical centric that is what is more ideal for these this axis does kamala harris coming is more better for them or is donald trump coming in power better for the new axis that we see i personally feel that if we look into the track record of uh, former president donald trump mm. from 2016 onwards though he is more gungo and he has exuded more bravo energy and aggressiveness and a kind of a xenophobia in his domestic and foreign policy towards the alien elements in who, who are interacting or having an interface with the uh, united states of america still trump has gone on to uh, very ni- very clearly articulate very clearly articulate in his campaign streak and in his uh, through his uh, ex account that the united states of america will not act as a global policeman so there will be a continuity 
there would be a persistence for uh, of isolationism in the uh, foreign policy streak of uh, president trump and that is the us foreign policy oh. and i think the chinese the russians and the north koreans and the iranians to a greater extent all four of them if we uh, zero in upon the uh, the axis the axis of evil as president george bush used to call it so they will be having an easier time they will be having a convenient time with president uh, donald trump though donald trump is the more gungo of uh, more gungo as compared to kamala harris and republicans have been known to be more aggressive and they tend to talk about the, the original ethos of the republicanism is about neo liberal institutionalism mm-hmm. taxing the uh, the rich less and uh, trying for an aggressive foreign policy which leaves the american uh, footprint at large in their areas of uh, interventions but president donald trump that way can be considered as a rebel if you go into his past uh, track record so you know that way if if donald trump becomes the most powerful man on the face of this earth then he is going to once again persist with his idea of american withdrawal the same withdrawal with the americans did in the immediately in the aftermath of their freedom and independence to develop themselves internally both militarily economically and societally the same pattern might get repeated we are only prognosticating shivam we are only forecasting so you know but if kamla harris comes then once again the american proactiveness is supposed to be more as far as this uh, evil as george bush connoted it she would like to uh, interfere in ukraine she would like to have more of a forceful hand as uh, the mandarins of president joe biden did as far as the hamas and israel squab squabble is concerned so and she will be more proactive and the democrats are going to be more intrusive as far as the what do you call the anti american or the anti western uh, colonnade of uh, russia china iran and north korea is concerned i would like to add to it sir this new axis led by china is pro trump at the moment is because trump has these are the last term for trump it doesn't have a lot of legacy to evolve on the mm-hmm. other hand kamala harris has just started she's quietly relatively younger so trump doesn't have a lot of agenda in terms of his this, the, the future of america and when trump comes to power it's all about trump it's all about trump very true right so that is why I, what i wanted to add and plus kamala harris is democratic and she would continue the democratic mindset that has been seen around the world and with so many conflicts happening now let's jump jump straight to the election sir i would want to understand from you the process and system of the us elections because it is one of one of the most important elections this year that we have seen uh, so many elections this year from indian election to taiwan election to pakistan election to so on mm-hmm. we had about one third of the the globe saw their elections this year mm-hmm. ending ending with the us elections in november definitely i would want to start on a very basic level of the understanding of the us elections us elections have two major candidates republicans and the democrats how do they go over and how do how is the country divided amongst these two very true it's a very pertinent question that we uh, we are looking at lot of externalities the entire media the, the we people as audience or uh, teachers like me and uh, good entrepreneurs like you and scholars like you we are we have been listening and we are being bombarded with the spectacle mm-hmm. that the united states of american elect presidential elections is first of all i would like to say that it was not meant to be a spectacle spectacle in the sense that when the founding fathers of america came together a uh, 200 years back as a nation and as a group of people who were charting out a trajectory for the american future mm-hmm. so at that point of time they wanted it to be a very a direct form of democracy you know the town hall ship variety the town hall variety mm-hmm. if you look into american literature and walter lippmann the journalist uh, and thoro their political thinkers it would just emanate from their writings and literature that americans founding fathers wanted the presidency to be very direct in the sense that a, a group of large number of people who would be academics who would be businessmen who would be free traders they would come together 
and they would directly say okay this person looks fine to us we have listened to his spectacular a uh, stump speech and he can be the perfect candidate mm-hmm. for becoming the american president that was supposed to be the original thematic perceived of the american nation so a democratic a democratic way is what they wanted democratic to do democratic way that is what they wanted to do hmm. but as uh, time went on as i would like to just reemphasize and reiterate my term spectacle everything is larger than life in america as it is definitively as it is definitely aided by a lot of uh, larger than life issues mm-hmm. and larger than life ramifications and amplifications so now the american system constitution is very clear about it the american constitution contains that it's a two party system only a two party system in america mm-hmm. one of them happens to be the republican political party the other one happens to be the democrats the democrat political party the americans uh, uh, really adhered to direct democracy but there's a criticism of the system which the americans talk about that is a presidential candidate might not be very popular amongst the american people or amongst the voters but still he or she can become the american uh, president hmm. going by the points uh, which one gets from the american electoral college now when we talk about the american electoral college we need to be very clear constitutionally as to how it is formed and how it functions what is the american electoral college though? definitely definitely it's a very pertinent poser as mm. i would like to put it uh, the american electoral college refers to all the 50 american states the constitution has provisions for it and what the american constitution uh, what do you call uh, goes ahead with or writes down Uh, or uh, what it actually uh, uh, writes down is that uh, the people of a particular state let's say california nebraska maine connecticut or let's say any other state in america they vo- they don't directly vote for the their president what they actually do is that they vote indirectly for a set of electors who constitute the electoral college now what i would like to explain over here or elucidate over here if kamala harris uh, attains the majority of electors it's not that ki she will win let's say you'll take the example of california state the state of california now the state of california has 55 electors which will go to washington and they will vote for a candidate so this is not proportional representation mm. it is a victor take all strategy uh, a victor take all dictum for example to make it clearer california it, it is not that ki kamala harris will uh, 37 electors are going to vote for her and the rest of the 18 will vote for trump the electors will have to sit together and decide going by the uh, by the adult franchise of the people of the state california I, i took as an example and only one name will be forwarded by all the electors that is either president trump will be forwarded from california uh, donald trump would be forwarded from california or kamala harris would be forwarded mm-hmm. so do the americans uh, uh, enjoy themselves with the idea of direct democracy it has been enshrined that was the word i was looking for it was enshrined in the american this thing american elections but it is a kind of a winner take all approach and it amounts to indirect elections wherein all the electors of all the states they get together and they decide about the number the whoever has the majority for example out of the 538 electors if the first candidate whether it is kamala harris or donald trump whichever reaches the 270 mark or the larger mark if it is a close contest that person would be anointed as the most powerful person on the face of the earth aka the american president so you know that is the political and constitutional perspective i would stop you here sir such an interesting way to elect a candidate this is but i want to understand it deeper uh, so basically if i am someone who lives in california i am going to be voting for a person who will be representing the electoral college is what you trying to say mm mm-hmm. and how many options does does this person from california has this person from california will have only two options will have two options have a republican options. option and a democratic option a democratic option and a republican option mm-hmm. and, and basis on the the winning of so what i understand from this that us is already divided 
between Republicans and Democrats in terms of states. Very true. In terms of states, and there's very uh, few margins to go either side. Very true. Very mm -hmm. true. So the first step is an individual votes for either Rep Republicans or Democrats, and that person. Goes to Washington, curate another election. Is what you say? No, no. What I'm trying to contend here, Mr. Shivam, is that we are not talking about a curation of an another election, but we are looking into the entire theme that electors, let's say the electors have decided mm. going by the votes in a state or a province in United States of America. So that entire state will select. Either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. Okay. There cannot be a fifty-fifty or a sixty-sixty shakeout. It is always going to be either the Democrat candidate or the Republican candidate. So, uh, so it is that is what the glitch comes in. Mm -hmm. It has been observed since the last five elections or the last five presidencies in America that has been discussed in New York Times, Washington Post, the Gallup polls, the Economist. And every everywhere that there might be a person who might get a candidate, a presidential candidate, might get more of popular votes. That is, he might be more popular, and he might be go going by the number. But if the electors select that person, that person might even have lesser popular vote than the person who has uh, won. Okay, that kind of a thing. Got it. So there are about fifty states in the U.S. Fifty states. Huh? Every state has a different number of uh... electors. Electoral colleges. Colleges. Okay. Okay. So there are five thirty-eight electoral colleges. Uh, electoral, uh, and we are talking about uh, electoral selector electors. There is only one electoral college in one st every in, state. Ha! Uh, there is one electoral college, and they they become a national and a fed federating electoral college once they go with the numbers to Washington mm -hmm. to select either or or. That is the kind of process, political process they follow, or the electoral process which they generally follow. Mm -hmm. That is the thing. So, if there are about fifty states, and let's say there is twenty-five states that are for Republicans and twenty-five mm -hmm. states for the Democrats, these all uh, colleges meet in Washington D.C. and how do they decide then? It is mentioned in the American Constitution. It is part of the legal speak of U.S. that uh, in the case of a tie. Which as, as, as something which you are port, uh, which you are portending about, which you are forecasting about, if half of the states want uh, Harris, Kamala Harris, and half of them vote for uh, Donald Trump, then the matter would go down to the House of Representatives, and they are the electors who are in the American Congress, not the Senate. The Senate is not empowered to do that, but the House of Representatives is going to once again have a vote on the floor. And then the tie would be resolved, and then the past tie would disappear, and the person who gets more votes in the House of Representatives would be made and would become the American president. That is the provision in the American rule uh, law book. That mm -hmm. is the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Interesting, sir. Ah, uh, that is interesting. You are someone who study have been studying U.S. for a long time. Their foreign policy, their internal policies, their defense, their trade. After analyzing everything about the elections this year, who do you think will win the elections? I think it's going to be a very close affair, as far as the presidential elections are concerned. And uh, it was a one-way street. It could have been a one-way street, luckily and fortunately for Donald Trump, if Joe Biden would have would not have resigned it or were withdrawn from the campaign. Or as the Democratic candidate, Democrat candidate, but he had a, a very uh, um, bad performance. He did not perform well in a TV debate uh, with President Donald Trump, and that really opened up all sorts of all sort of uh, hornet's nests. And the Democrats, who were the old the older Democrats, the supporters of Democrats, the financiers of the uh, the Democratic Party, they all. Uh, Began to raise questions about the efficacy of the candidature of Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, who is still the American president. And if Joe Biden would have remained the candidate, though it not it would not have been a cakewalk for Donald Trump, but definitely he would have won the elections. I can risk that prediction against Joe Biden, 
because the americans have not done too well in the foreign policy realm against joe biden that was one part of it the american economy though it has improved now but during the first part of joe biden's tenure it was struggling inflation was high interest rates had to be heightened up by people like janet allen the head of the federal bank in united states of america so you know donald trump would have had an edge and more than a edge and a cascading victory might have come his way Mm-hmm. but with kamla harris coming along uh, it seems that uh, this will be a, a, a tight tight rope walk for both donald trump and the D- democratic candidate kamla harris mm-hmm. first of all people have begun identifying since july august when uh, kamla harris was negotiated uh, became the democratic candidate so people have started talking about it in the sense of reminiscing about uh, president barack obama the kind of academic background he had how he was from the american ivy league universities the same kind of academic and intellectual wiener is automatically being attached to uh, kamala harris which is very natural and this is an edge this is a place i personally feel this academic elitist and you know the purely american success story imagery which people have started associating with kamala harris that might be enough to give a difficult time to the candidature of donald trump though he cannot be short shifted in any way mm-hmm. he is still very strong and if you look at the recent polls by reliable pollsters such as the economist and the yougov poll or several other agencies which are talking about it we can find that two uh, percent of a lead has been attributed to the candidature of Kamala Harris, and let's say if somebody says that forty nine percent of the people are going to vote for Kamala Harris, then forty seven percentage is something which is associated, getting associated with President Donald Trump, uh, with Donald Trump, mm-hmm. the former president. Mm-hmm. So that way, right now. the statisticians and the cephalologists are predicting a close match between both the candidates but it is definitely advantage kamala harris in the light of the issues which we can talk about let's say issues like gun running issues like immigration issues like foreign policy and the state of the economy whatever there she seems to have an edge because trump seems repetitive to some people now mm. while kamala harris has clearly identified his entire electoral agenda and what she intends to do some people are talking about it as a kind of a too much of an ask something which might not be supported by the mim complex that is the military industry and the media complex in united states of america mm. and uh, it might seem very impractical to some of some of the people but still going by the trajectory of trump and harris i think harris it is advantage kamala harris now mm-hmm. at this present present juncture in the month of september 2024 got it as an american if you were to narrow down five issues that govern their decision making on who should be the president what would those five points be i personally feel that uh, issues uh, are definitely definitely there i can take out a, i can enumerate a few first one happens to be that of immigration i we can go into it detail let's not go in depth ha. i just want to know what, what are, are the, the issues issues that people uh, want to make a decision on basis basically definitely i think uh, uh, the scourge of immigration the scourge mm. of gun running the issue of abortion rights yes. the debates that went on in the context of american legalia mm-hmm. like the overturning of the judgment of roe versus wade mm-hmm. the coming in of the dobbs and plant parenthood uh, uh, women organize women uh, organization mm-hmm. and several other such uh, uh, case uh, case law they are very pertinent uh, issues or themes around which the decision of the american citizens will revolve around mm-hmm. so abortion is one immigration is one and several other foreign policy is one healthcare is one so these are going to be the primal issues mm-hmm. the primal path finders which will in the end determine the mindsets of the american electorate for so how important is the element of foreign policy for an american in today's time 
if you look into the general uh, public opinion then repeatedly if you uh, look at gallops and uh, the pew research center polls they are all recorded in their different sample uh, sizes that foreign policy happens to be an important uh, what do you call pathfinder or an important factor uh, in making the people's d- d- decide people mm. decide about the american presidential elections but some polls have talked about uh, have pointed towards a different trajectory also <laughs> that the american citizen or the american commoner might not be very interested in what america does outside or globally they are not saying that america should withdraw but that kind of a taint and a negative uh, imagery or a negative perception has crept into the american hypoloid mindset that foreign policy is a secondary thing or not a tertiary thing as yet but as president trump wanted to put it across to his american denizens it happens to be a secondary theme and the domestic issues which we have just enumerated these domestic issues will be the primary factors which will decide the outcome of the american presidential elections mm-hmm. that is how i look at it america also has a concept of debates what is the idea of these debate presidential debates because uh, we saw that either of them weren't interested in doing a debate now but now there is three debates aligned for all these two uh, the republicans and the democrats the coming month what is the concept and why is it so important in the us legacy since world war 2 the domestic polity in america i would like to reiterate is a spectacle mm. and it's a showman showmanship mm. mm. it is definitely a, a definitively a showmanship where the sparkles and the background of the star spangled banner along with the confetti descending upon the people and the candidate on the rostrum mm. they have always been you know the determining factors of a candidate's fate as far as the american elections are concerned and going in the same trajectory persisting with the same trajectory the televised debates also give the people an opportunity to judge and gauge their candidates so that the television debates have become a part and parcel of a couch potato to american citizenry which wants to really look into the issues the persona the oratorial skills the skill and the and the rostrum poise of the candidate as he or she uh, what you call genuflects before the rest of the country so i think tv debates are part of the american dream mm-hmm. people are looking for a dream people are looking for an approach and the candidate has to sell his agenda which can be equated once again to the grandiose and grandiloquent american dream and people are going to lap it up if it means sense to them if it gels in with their day to day lives challenges and routinized rituals mm-hmm. that's why the tv debates are very important got it got as it. far as american elections are concerned mm-hmm. sir i was recently watching the news and the news was about how the information warfare in geopolitics in terms of the us election is playing at the moment for example russia is putting out information about why people should vote for trump and trump getting in power is beneficial for the russia or even china yesterday i was watching news about how vladimir putin was mocking on how, why kamala harris should come as a president but the reality mm-hmm. is that they want trump to come in power what is the importance of this information warfare in geopolitics these days sir definitely That- so i think uh, information warfare is an important component and in every significant uh, element as far as the geopolitical scenario in a country is concerned now this is not a new trend at all it is just that foreign interference and foreign intrusions have been a part and parcel of american elections chinese to intervene through their funds and through their hackers and through their spy agencies the russians also uh, do the same thing in the same manner through their own uh, subterfuge and subtle intervention into the american political system hmm. when you talk about the supply chains and the money chains i think in the age of globalization convergence and uh, interdependence no country is isolated not even america from the foreign influence and uh, right from the beginning the uh, trump has been talking about it that the russians helped him one conspiracy theory goes like this that the russian establishment helped the first coming of 
Donald Trump as the American president. Hmm. You know, because the the entire supply supply chains, trade, investment, finances, they are part or part and parcel of the same matrix. Uh-huh. Their money or the greenbacks, they do not differentiate between Russia, China, and America. Somebody of the order of uh, what do you call Alan Alan Musk or uh, somebody else, uh, they can go in and they can influence the political process, which has become. a much ordained factor which has become a very common conditionality as far as the internal and domestic politics of countries are concerned mm-hmm. that is how i would look at it so i uh, now i want to bring our focus to india which of these two candidates would be a better option for india in terms of foreign policy that it is a very important question for we as indians there has been a lot of visits from our officials and now the pm would be visiting next month as well first tell us who sh- who is good for us and then pm modi's visit to the us i would personally feel that uh, if you look at prime minister narendra modi's foreign policy and diplomacy he left no stone unturned uh, not to become an ally of united states of america but but in order to, be, uh, to convert india into a more a more of a pro american stand and the personal chemistry mm-hmm. that went on between uh, prime minister narendra modi and president donald for donald trump is not to be hidden we all are aware of it because we are all media output guzzlers mm-hmm. so you know the manner in which president narendra modi spoke in 2016 in new york in the madison square garden speech the way he was able to enamor himself to the younglings to the youngsters and people had dr- driven hundreds of kilometers to come to the madison square garden and how he got a rock stars welcome as far as the madison square garden is concerned this is one part of it the second event which comes to my mind which is more than an event but it's because it signifies the change in the trajectory for india us relations that is the shark tanks engagement of uh, president narendra modi where he went to uh, seattle and he directly invited the startups the american startups and the american entrepreneurs and big firms to mm. to come and invest in india at a particular point of time then we move on to the trajectory of the third motera stadium spectacle where in indian government modi ji definitively i would say at a risk has uh, taken a leaf out of the american book not about the the soul and the spirit of indian elections and the indian political ring marol but the confetti uh, tint uh, confetti colored occasions and the larger than life stage uh, uh, enunciations of elections mm-hmm. they got a reflection in the motera stadium wherein president trump uh, and uh, our prime minister narendra modi modi ji they came together and inked pacts and executed confidence in each other's nations abilities to wade through the challenges and the negativities and go embark on a more fruitful and constructive pattern for both the countries mm-hmm. as far as foreign policy and demo- uh, diplomacy is concerned so if we are practically speaking trump might be isolationist or he may he might be withdrawing the americans but because of the special significance he attached to india to new delhi trump might be a good option but if kamala harris comes then i personally feel that uh, indian diaspora will which is a welcome development will play a g- greater role as far as uh, uh, foreign policy or having a tete a tete with narendra modi ji is concerned but if you look into the a few standpoints that kamala harris had then at that point of time we can look into the 1990s and the uh, early 21st century where there have been more than one occasion where the kashmir issue has been discussed by kamala harris and very surprisingly that is how it is very complicated that president joe biden supported india as far as the kashmir imbroglio is concerned we should not use the word quagmire or conflict or even imbroglio because as our prime minister says a uh, talks and terror cannot go together that is why we are not going to talk anything on kashmir mm-hmm. with pakistan so you know but kamala harris has supported pakistan in the uh, in the past tense and she has been very sympathetic towards some national forces 
and other fissiparias and centripetal tendencies which have made life very difficult or which has uh, cost us lives of brave soldiers and common citizens since the last 2 to 3 decades mm -hmm. so one cannot completely rely upon kamala harris mm -hmm. and one can also not contend that because she spoke this particular manner in this particular manner or this was her specific stance uh, as far as uh, Kashmir is concerned or disarmament and weapons proliferation is concerned. So she might be all bad for India. Mm. That is not, that would be a very narrow way of looking at it, sure. a narrow prism. I personally feel uh, if we go for a very balanced and unemotional prognostication about who comes, I think it won't make much of a difference as far as uh, whether Kamala Harris becomes the American president or uh, Donald Trump becomes the president mm -hmm. because it is going to be a stable, democratic, rule of law and constitution ordained relationship between India and US. Gone are the times of America eulogizing Pakistan mm -hmm. as a frontline state. Yeah. Now, we are also in the need of American help. America needs us and we need America as a kind of a transactional court procure because of the rise of China. And we are not only talking about China, India and America here in the context of the containment of China. You, you, you look at in, uh, Middle East, R2, U2 group of countries, countries like the Quad, the Australians, the Japanese, the New Zealanders, the Kiwis, they all are coming together hmm. to prop up each other as a kind of a obstructor or a, a obstructor of the Chinese hegemony, both in the Indo-Pacific seas and also globally. Mm -hmm. So I personally feel that Kamala Harris will change or she will become more uh, India friendly or she would understand the Indian concerns yeah. as far as foreign policy is concerned and Trump we can always bet on yeah. because Prime Minister Modi has a personal rapport with him which is uh, very unprecedented mm -hmm. because in the past when people like uh, very reverent personages like Pandit Nehru, they went to America during the time of President Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, at that point of time, we had a very bad press for India, which prevented India into cementing a stronger uh, base or a strong, stronger substratum mm -hmm. as far as India-US relations go. Mm -hmm. So I think Kamala Harris would be conscious about India and she would be sensitive about Indian concerns regarding South Asia and China. That yeah. is what I personally feel about it, Shiva. What I understand here is that in geopolitics, sir, a lot of uh, nations use information warfare to get their interested parties in power in places like the US. But India stays behind this because it, it doesn't want to be involved in a lot of uh, internal situations in the US or any other country. But we still have our say and we do perform our duties how we're supposed to do as the, the, the leader of the Global South that we try to show. So we, we, we saw that the Modi ji visited Russia as well as Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And now he's also visiting the US to, to see the situation and, you know, really tell them that India is there in any case. We don't pick sides. Mm -hmm. Having said that, it is very important to elect the right candidate in the US because the person has the, the most power in the world, like you rightly said, has the power to utilize. And I know it's a very uh, subtle thing to say that they have the power to initiate the nuclear bomb for that matter. They have the codes. Mm. So it is important to have a sane leader in living a, a right kind of life around the globe. Very true. So to end this conversation, I would like you to tell me a little about your book that you had authored with us. It's called The Serenity and the American Dream that you authored, sir. Very true. So very nice that you're considering this book. It was so energetically and productively published by Pentagon Press. We are not advertising here for anyone, mm -hmm. but still the book did well academically. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the main inspiration as far as myself, as far as I'm concerned about the book is that it's a serendipity for the rest of the world that America is powerful. They know that America is powerful and America has its, uh, uh, what do you call, power equations doing the rounds with the rest of the world and it can dominate and it is the global, global super cop. Mm -hmm. But the Orient does not directly accept it never used to accept it because of the socialist and the communist mindset and because of the dictum of strategic autonomy that the Asiatic countries had. 
So, you know, in India, when we used to study in our uh, days, there was a distrust of United States of America, diplomatically and foreign policy wise. And Americans were looked down upon as being neo-colonial hegemons. Hmm. A sobriquet which fits more uh, effectively with PRC, that is People's Republic of China. So, you know, that kind of a obfuscation, that kind of a lack of clarity, a want of truthfulness existed in other countries. And, you know, what we need to understand here, which is something which I have attempted to communicate uh, through, my, uh, through my book, The Serendipity and the American Dream, that no country works on philanthropy. Instead, every country like India and America or any sane political leader would not let his country's nation international interests to be harmed or obstructed. This is something which the Americans have been doing in a very plain Jane manner. But mm. if you look at the establishment in India, we still have that complaint that they are very high-handed. Once they come, they come with a stiff upper lip. They are very snobbish. And you know, that kind of an uh, stiffness, which people associated with the Britishers earlier on, that is also attributed in the Indian establishment to a great extent, as far as the, um, their American interface mm -hmm. or interface with the American establishment is concerned. So I was pained, though I'm an Indian citizen and a patriotic and a nationalist Indian, but you know, a great deal can be achieved with the India and United States of America recognizing each other's dream, mm -hmm. each other's culture, and each other's foreign policy concerns, so that we can cobble together some sort of an alliance, which already has become a geopolitical reality through Quad, I2, U2, and through the uh, intransigence of Vladimir Putin and the, and the Chinese premier. So whether the Indians or whether the Asians want it or not, mm -hmm. uh, the American dream has... Uh, opened its canopy mm -hmm. and that kind of an American dream which bears good space and good uh, uh, what you call respect for Indians and the rest of Asia can become the order of the day. So it, this book is a kind of a clarion call not for American dominance but a kind of a better, a more nu nuanced and a more subtle understanding of the American domestic scenario and the American foreign policy. Right. This is how he, I attempted to mm -hmm. carve out a narrative which I feel mm -hmm. uh, was non-existent in the Indian circles and academia. Mm -hmm. That is how I would put it. If you wish to really understand the, the US at the moment in terms of their internal policies and the foreign policies, this book is must have and I would urge the audience to buy it as well. The link would be in description. Please check it out. Sir, last question to end our conversation. Mm -hmm. I know I've said that before. Last question is, the race of the changing world order having a superpower between China and the US is edge to edge right now. Mm -hmm. As an expert, what do you think it's going to end with? We all are uh, human beings. We all believe in humanism. And even Narendra Modi, or be it Trump or Kamala Harris, they will not want a world war to be festooned upon the geopolitical firmament or the geopolitical space. Because, you know, talking in a gungo fashion or being very excited about it might suit uh, some of us as kids or some of us as, uh, what do you call, very lay, uh, lay kind of an observation on international relations and global politics. So, you know, we have to be, we have to play the entire world system or the geopolitical scenario is very precariously poised. We are having two conflict zones which are visible to us because we can see the media reporting about the Russian massacring of the Ukrainians mm -hmm. in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, in the first phase of the uh, first phase of the Russian invasion, which Vladimir Putin calls at a calls as a special military operation. Mm -hmm. But Indians are goody goody. Narendra Modi ji is friendly with Putin and uh, with the Zelensky too. So you know, generally the idea is that a peaceability, an approach, a peace research approach should be predominant. And our Prime Minister has been very proactive about it. When he visited Ukraine, when he visited Poland, when he met uh, Zelensky, and when he separately met uh, Vladimir Putin, the Russian Premier, he went on and said that India is willing to become the negotiator. Mm. India can mediate. Now, we are not saying that 
we have such a large stature attached to us or we are so much pontificated that narendra modi ji would be enough to bring about a mm-hmm. cease fire in ukraine russia war mm-hmm. but still since the last 9 to 10 years the stature of india as a conflict resolver india as a responsible international actor on the high table of power politics has been augmented multiple times india has reproached both zelensky reproached zelensky and vladimir putin to say no no to war mm-hmm. and they have invited india has invited along with the multifarious efforts of the american establishment that both the warring parties can come to a table and a conflict should not be decided on a battlefield mm. on the ran kshetra but on the negotiating table where diplomacy can rule the roost and the innocent citizens of a war's uh, uh, vagary can be can escape that kind of a, a stringent and miserable condition mm-hmm. that is how i would look at it without uh, denouncing the pattern of hegemony that putin and xi jinping mm. have entered into since the last few years thank you shubham shubham it's 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 nice that you ended our conversation in bringing the perspective on india's approach on national uh, foreign policy and how we would like to see the world having said that these this is an important lesson for the rest of the world the geopolitics and may the best man or woman win in this case very so. true very true that is all begins uh, this has been a very insightful conversation for me and i'm sure it's been for the audience as well thank you so much sir for spending the time thank you and your patience for us thank you I'm so much i'm thankful to you for uh, inviting me here thank you sir thank you we at TOAP are working really hard to take this podcast to the next level our guests are going to get even better our production quality is going to get even better and hopefully i'm going to get even better too most importantly we are committed to being consistent and continue to do what we love the most until then keep reimagining yourself and know that the power of change lies within you jai hind